Welcome to Rune Soup, a podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. Coming to you from... My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Enjoy. Today on Rune Soup, we speak to ethnobotanist, educator, witch, and author Becky Bayer. Becky is based in Appalachia, and it is the exploration of this bioregion that finds expression in her herbalism, art, magic, agriculture, and teaching. Becky, thank you very much for your time. No problem. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, uh, I'm quite looking forward to this, uh, given your bio. But Becky, were you a weird kid? Um. Yeah, definitely. That's not even... I don't know why I hesitated to say that. Such as? So uh, t- t- describe your weirdness, your childhood weirdness <laughs> to us. <laughs> well, I guess when I was little, I was definitely obsessed with fantasy and magic, and I was a and d kid, and I was a Ren Faire nerd. And I um, we grew up on a small farm in central New Jersey, but we moved around a lot. And we had animals and things. It was really fun, but I didn't really know how to talk to other kids. I was kind of, I don't know. I would just be like, hey, did you guys know that, you know, you can zap people with your magic, with your energy? Like, and then I'd freak them out and they all call me witch at school and make fun of me. And it was, it was definitely pretty weird. But, and I'd sing to myself on the bus. I got made fun of for doing that a lot, like quietly to myself as if no one could hear me. Just, um, just whatever was on the radio or were you making up your own songs? Um, I think I was listening to my, my Walkman because I'm 30 and I had a Walkman. And uh, listening to my CDs, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the CD Walkman. God, they were annoying to get. Like CDs are such a large object, really. You know. I know they were so they were so like bulky after the tape player. And they'd skip. Um, you know. You, That's you, true. You knock it once, and they'd skip. And you go, oh, come on. All right. So tell me about some of the. Uh, you, you mentioned you were a fantasy <laughs> reader. What were some of the um, seminal texts from childhood? Oh my goodness. My favorite, I think my favorite were Tamora Pierce's books, um, uh, Wild Magic, and um, I love the Juniper series, Wise Child. They were wonderful. About, I think they were actually about like ancient Cornwall. Um, <laughs> and the Abhorson series uh, by Garth Nix. Loved all those books. And of course, Harry Potter, you know, came out the year I was 11. Um, Harry Potter was supposed to be 11 so it was I really enjoyed growing with those books as they came out nice one and were you I mean were you from a reading family or did you oh yes yeah. <laughs> my grandfather's a prof- well was a professor he's retired now at Carnegie Mellon I'm also studying to be a professor and we are a big reading family for sure and was uh, this kind of interest in the that kind of fantasy stuff a family thing, or were you the kid in the corner while they were reading <laughs> fancy texts and you're reading this this uh, book by a Scottish woman about some English kid with a scar on his forehead? That's true. That's exactly what was happening. Um, I, yeah, I was the only one. My brothers, when we were little, were interested in it, but they kind of outgrew it, and I kind of stayed, um, you know, wrapped up in it as I got older. <laughs> And from, I guess, a, a practitioner perspective, were they were you from a family that was sympathetic to such things, or are you, you know, still a black sheep in that mm-hmm. sense? Well, I'm definitely the black sheep of my family, but they're very loving and kind, despite the fact that they're very conservative and I'm quite liberal. And they were actually really supportive. My mom always said, you know, whatever book you want, you can have, as long as I can look at it and make sure it's like not got anything super you know, terrible for a child to read. So she bought me actually when I was 11 and 12 and started asking for books about witchcraft. She bought me Manly P. Hall's book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages and all these other books I asked for. She she didn't mind getting them for me. And I, I really thank her for that. Well, reading is reading. I know. I guess she was happy I wasn't, you know, out doing terrible things. That's more or less uh, where, where it was for, for my mother as well. It's like, well, he could ask for money for drugs or books, so yeah. I, I, like I guess this is a win. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, I mean, what you were kind of describing how you would say and freak out other children uh, about <laughs> talking about magic. I mean, was this something you kind of naturally did? I mean, were there any kind of high strange incidents in the childhood that made you realize, wait a minute, this is potentially more than fiction? Oh my gosh, this is actually funny. No one's ever asked me that before, and it's really funny. 
when I was, um, I grew up in the Unitarian Universalist Church, which has a Cups chapter, which is the pagan chapter of that church. And it's not a Christian church. It's like a, pro- it was a Protestant sect, but it's not really Christian at all anymore. And my Sunday school teacher was a Wiccan. And when I was 11, she, she was telling us about her personal beliefs. And I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. I want to know about that. And she started teaching us how to do energy work and different things. And I remember as a kid, I, she had given me a chandelier crystal on a string. And when you're a little kid, you have no reason to disbelieve that you can do anything, you know? And she's like, well, you guys can, you can tie it to a chair and stare at it and move it with your mind. And like, we could all do it. And it was like, none of us thought, of course we can't, you know, none of us thought we couldn't do it. And I took it to school and I remember I showed it to some kids and I was like, you guys try it, like, see if you can do it. And many of them could do it. And that also sealed my fate as, um, definitely getting made fun of forever about being a witch. So, uh, but I, I, I tried it again recently and I can't move it at all. And I was like, how did we, do, how did we do that when we were young? Like we had no barriers, you know? Yeah. That's fascinating. I, uh, oh gosh, now I want to steal my uh, nephews and nieces and see if they can't move stuff with their mind. They're getting into that age. Try them with a, something, a weight on a string tied to a you know a chair leg or something, and see. Ask them if they can push it with the little hands in their eyes. That's what our teacher asked us to do, and it actually worked. It was amazing. Yeah, and that's when I really believed it. My little niece is terrifying, though. If I give her like psychokinetic powers, the the city will fall. So. Uh, oh my goodness! Yeah. <laughs> Children are truly the most terrifying. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at modern horror fiction. <laughs> no, exactly. Um, that's really cool. So was that from 11 is when you decided, oh, wait, this stuff works. And then it was, uh, mm-hmm. does that make you a kind of a, a practitioner through high school as well? Definitely, except I moved when I was in eighth grade to a new school and I didn't tell anybody about my interests because I didn't want to be made fun of anymore. And um, I just kept it secret, but I was very active. I also spent time on a, the Blackfeet Indian Reservation in high school, and that really furthered my practice and opened up some different avenues for me that I think eventually led me into the world of traditional witchcraft and well, away from Wicca. Yeah, so um, when you say you spent time there, was that, um, was that living there or were you co-located so you could go and hang out? No, I, was, I lived there for three months doing a service project when I was 16, and it it was really amazing. Um, it was very, that, that was when I really like, you know, I was like, okay, so people might be able to move things with their minds. But that was when I was like, all right, the world is an animated and active place and things will reach out and touch you when they want to, <laughs> but to move you in the ways that they want you to be moved. And I realized that the spirit world was alive and well. So what was it specifically during those three months? I mean, was it a particular incident or was it, you know, being around kind of life ways that describe the universe in, in that, I would just, I would say more accurate fashion. Mm-hmm. It's a good question. Um, there are a lot of things that happen too many to say briefly, but I just so many things happened. I mean, the fire alarms were pulled at night by unseen hands in the, in the building we were sleeping in, um, constantly there were, you know, paint buckets left out. You walk around the corner later on and there's a, uh, you know, a hundred little children handprints down the side of the building we're painting. And it's like all these things kept happening. And we were like, we, we can't deny that that stuff is happening here and that it's weird that we're here and that we're white people and that we're, we're experiencing this stuff. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's kind of a, well, not exactly that, um, but it, it's kind of a common journey from uh, starting off with a few little, tricks that demonstrate maybe you know um consciousness effects to building a or to realize that or to realizing you and actually you inhabit a uh animate universe and there's a there's a kind of natural progression from here's a fun little trick within the worldview of i guess at the time 20th century um (laughs) 21st century you know american culture (laughs) to now like this needs to be built into a belief system because there's evidently something to it definitely i think that the word animism definitely rings true for those experiences for sure so was it something i mean from 11 on uh given what you're studying now which i'm very excited to talk about um 
was was there really any other question like did, did you go through a phase where you wanted to be a fireman or or was this kind of it for you <laughs> <laughs> my, my fireman stage um I wanted to be an artist you know for a long time and I still do a lot of art as part of my livelihood but I always knew I think from like I remember being eight years old the first time I was like, I want to be a witch so bad. That's all I ever want. You know, like that's all I could ever ask for. And, um, I never really changed and I just wanted to grow food and I'd do a lot of farming and teach classes on agriculture and painting and being a witch. And that's all I wanted. And that's what I do now. And it's kind of cool at my cusp of my, my 30th birthday to, to be like, Oh, I guess I'm doing the things I wanted to do when I was eight years old. And that's pretty cool. (laughs) Yeah. That's the dream. Yeah, mind you, not making very much money, but doing my best I can. <laughs> well, you should have told eight-year-old you wanted to be a rich witch. I know. That's not the magic that I work right now. No. <laughs> maybe we'll work it. Maybe we'll yeah. move towards that soon. So it's interesting, and I, I want to talk about this because um, how we re- think what we previously called appropriation, given that we kind of have new terms in um, in the mm. language now to to think about um, how we engage with and learn cross culturally, you said the um, the reservation mm. experience. Potentially, let me put it this way: potentially, if that had happened to you, if you were sixteen in the seventies and you were doing that, you may well have gone down a kind of sort of half Carlos Castaneda, half I make <laughs> yes. I make dream catches kind of area. So, um, mm-hmm. the, before we had the kind of tools to think about culture and indeed things like you know northwest european history we would look at something that's evidently real that we don't have and go well i'll just move over there then and i'm not sure if that's Mm -hmm. the uh in fact i know that that's not the right way to do it (laughs) and Uh, i agree with you 100 percent. so was that the kind of thinking process where you go well this stuff is kind of if it's real here it's real everywhere so how do i go on that journey that's a very that's a wonderful question. Um I knew then when I was 16 that that wasn't for me, you know? That's not I was there and I was happy to be there and people were kind to us and were happy that we were there but and I actually got to be a part of a Sundance, which was pretty amazing as a 16-year-old spoiled white girl getting to be a part of that. Um but I knew that I I knew what my ancestry was and that I had an indigenous past somewhere in there. And that's when I was 18 I started really looking into that and looking into well what what is my Sundance? What is left over from that time? Um I'm German and English and Irish and Welsh. And I'm wondering what's what else is there for me and that's when I kind of started figuring out about bioregionalism and animism and traditional witchcraft and and really connecting with those things. And uh, now that I live in Appalachia and will always live here, I've really kind of sunk down into that bioregional identification of where do I live now and what is for me here. And um, what were some of the the texts at the sort of 18-year-old time depth that made you realize, ooh, uh, this is that thing that I knew was out there that I found? Well, it... Right on then, I was still reading a lot of, like, you know, Lou Allen texts. That's all I really had access to. And I didn't have or know anyone doing more witchcraft than me, if that makes sense. Like, people, I was the one people would come to to be like, Becky, what's what's up with this? I had I saw a ghost, or I'm scared of this demon is following me, or, you know, help me out. And I had a few mentors. I, I just had a hard time finding other other practitioners to spend time with. And um, I had a lot of internet friends, of course, in the early 2000s. And um, I think I read Isaac Bonewitz's work, and I read um, all of, I reread all of Doreen Valiente's work, actually. And I'm probably saying her last name wrong, so forgive me. No, that's right. But... Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, we're and, both doing it wrong, but there you go. <laughs> oh, well, lovely. I read her work again, The Natural Magic. And um, I don't know, I, when I reread Natural Magic, I was like, I really like taking the god and goddess like kind of imposed religion of Wicca out and looking at this practical kind of workbook that she had created. And I started looking for other things like that, which it took me a few more years to find um, uh, the bioregionalism blog, bioregional animism. And um, 
that really excited me. And Sarah Ann Wallace's work online, I think I found in like 2000, I don't know, I want to say 2009 or 10 when she started blogging. I really got excited about that stuff. I was like, this is what I've been looking for. So it was honestly like internet sources that helped me at first, for sure. Well, there's there's people at the other end of it, you know. So I know. Sarah's very, uh, Sarah's very inspirational in that in that way. Yeah, and Marcus has become a good friend of mine. Well, I wouldn't say super good. We we mostly talk on the internet, but I present at Beardus Genie Symposium, and I'll be there again this year. And I just <laughs> love meeting them. So <laughs> I like how you opened that sentence. I thought it was going to end somewhere very different. I'm like, oh, Marcus and I are really good friends. Well, I wouldn't say super good. I I, I thought the next half of that sentence was going to be, we had a massive fight in a Denny's. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I've ever been in a day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tried and true terrible hippie. Yeah, nice um, one. <laughs> yeah, right? But Marcus, no, I love Marcus. He's a wonderful mentor and friend. And I really love his work. So, um, I mean, let's talk. Uh, I'll, I'll start it with this question as well. For dirty foreigners like me who are listening to the show, uh, what, <laughs> uh, what even is Appalachia? Well, number one, you have to say it correctly. Appalachia? Appalachia. Appalachia, gotcha. Appalachia. I thought that was just the town because I I had this on a video Q and A, but now now I've now I've been learned. So it's Appalachia. What even is it? Well, it's a uh, it's really confusing. I'm in a Appalachian Studies program at Appalachian State University for my master's, and we argue constantly about what is Appalachia. The Appalachian Regional Commission would say that it is a mountainous region from western Pennsylvania down towards Mississippi. But other, you know, it's defined in so many different ways as both a region and a culture in the southern United States. Um, but it's like the mountain south versus the deep south, which is Louisiana, Mississippi, um, and the lowland south. And um, how does one, uh, you said you moved around a lot from sort of New Jersey and so on, but uh, presumably around 18, like wh- wh- when did you first visit and when did you first realize, nah? This is for me. <laughs> well, I always knew I had ancestors from Eastern Kentucky. And, you know, my grandparents lived in Virginia, in Fairfax, and had come down here to visit them. But I came to visit my best friend, who has been my fellow, very close practitioner friend since we were 18. And we we're still best friends and practice together a lot. She moved here after college when she was, we were, I guess we were 22, it was in 2009. And she called me and she's like, Becky, you have to move to Asheville. I live outside of Asheville, North Carolina. And it's a really cool kind of uh, progressive, artistic, music rich um, craft. Like, it's just an amazing place in uh, Western North Carolina and beautiful, extremely biodiverse region. And as a plant nerd, I was like, all oh, right, I'm in. I came to visit in January of 2009 and I was like, I'm moving here as soon as I graduate. And I moved here in March 2010. Yeah, I um I don't know who I was talking to about this recently, but Asheville is like the town now. That's the place. It's as you say, it's got the music and the um the attitude, the you know, a liberal attitude and arts and crafts and as you mentioned, an amazing bioregion. It does. And not only does it have the liberal attitude, but you know, I'm good friends with many of my neighbors who are have very different beliefs than I do and are traditional old school Appalachian folks and they're wonderful and have a lot to share and you know they're definitely I had a lot of preconceived stereotypes about the types of people I would meet in Appalachia and it's it's been amazing to learn and grow and be an Appalachian citizen which is how I identify since I wasn't born here (laughs) Uh, that's a good way of thinking about it um so (laughs) speaking of born here if we're talking about um Appalachia and we move into various kind of Folk ways, uh, what are the predominant kind of cultural backgrounds that we should probably start there as we go and and move forward into, you know, folk and herbalism and so on? For sure. It's a really amazing story. You know, Appalachia, people always say, oh, Scotch-Irish, one of which, I mean, some people don't like the term Scotch-Irish because it's, you know, Scotch isn't really a word, but Scottish-Irish and then the northern, um, I guess the, the north borderlands. A lot of people came from there. Germany isn't often mentioned, but there's a large German population that came to Appalachia. And then you have the Catawba and the Cherokee people who already lived here <laughs> and other many other smaller tribes. And um, West African slaves, specifically West Africa, a lot of people were brought here from West Africa to these mountains. 
And many people who are, have ancestors from that time can trace their ancestry back to West Africa. So it's like Cherokee, Catawba, West Africa, Western Europe. It's kind of like all the different cultures coming together in these mountains. And uh, was it, were they specifically agricultural slaves? Was it a, a mining thing? I mean, what, what, what brought the colonists mm. to Appalachia? Well, a lot of people came, you know, the, the big push from Appalachia was kind of down from Pennsylvania. Um, people had been coming into the northern states first, and they didn't really come directly down to the south. They kind of migrated down once they arrived here up north in the established, you know, Jamestown colonies and all those other places. And um, I guess, you know, land was free or cheap if you could get out here. It was an incredibly treacherous terrain. The mountains are very large, and they're some of the oldest mountains in the world. And um, we don't have big plantation lands here. Like the slavery was much less common here than it was in the deep south because there weren't big, you know, sugar plantations or tea plantations or rice plantations. There was mostly like one or two personal slaves in rich households. But I mean, here in Madison County, the county over from me, there are actually many union supporters um, and non-slave owners. So it's a, it's a, it's an interesting spot being here in Western Carolina because it wasn't necessarily like how you might imagine, you know, it would be, <laughs> but there definitely were slaves and many of them, but they did different, more probably just like personal farm things rather than the big plantations that owned like a hundred slaves. Yeah. It's, um, that that's kind of where I was thinking in my head. I'm like, it, it seems almost, we would call those sort of farms more like homesteads today. So I was trying to work out what yes, that would yeah. look like. Yeah. Um, so we go in. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I just, <laughs> <laughs> I just um, there was an interesting, because so much music comes from this area. Um, the banjo, you know, is from Africa originally. And, there were these um, where many free black people would drive turkeys and hogs across. The, there's these drovers roads and white and black folks together would drive animals for market across the mountains together and stop and play music together and actually share space and time and exchange, you know, musical ideas here. So it's, it's just an interesting, you know, of course it has an extremely racist and, and intense history, just like the rest of the United States, but it, is, it has some unique patches in it and some stories I think that are really interesting and presumably uh, those kind of uh, cross pollinizations uh, contribute to its uh, well its folk magic I guess I mean what is Definitely. that one of the things let's <laughs> let's talk about that and and why Appalachian folk magic is unique I think that's that's definitely what makes it unique you can kind of you know um has, I'll give you an example so um, Adam and Eve root. You can find that growing all over right now. I just harvested some myself. It's a putty root is its more common name. It's a type of orchid that grows in the woods here. And some of the roots are round and some of them are pointy. So Eve and Adam, you know, and uh, you would give an Eve root to a woman to curse her from finding true love and an Adam root to a man for the same purpose. It's very heteronormative. And, um, you know, vice versa, you'd give a woman an Adam root or a man an Eve root if you wanted them to find love. But that practice apparently was was passed over from the Cherokee who used the Adam and Eve root for love magics, and it was adopted by um, white and black colonists and um, people that moved into the region and kind of augmented it with their own personal beliefs. And so it's just interesting to see all the different uses of this root, um, which you can buy at hoodoo supply stores now too, and botanicas that comes from this native practice. So it's all very interesting to try to trace back where, where you can, because some of it's so muddled, you can't really tell where it came from. It's interesting. It's a wild growing orchid as well, because further down, that's essentially what High John is further down south. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that, I mean, the, the presumption, and I'm sure you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the presumption is the same with uh, High John, that it also migrated across from you know, First Nations into into slave and, and um, you know, freed people practices. Exactly. Yeah, it's really, it's pretty amazing. So how does that, I mean, the, um, the cultures that that sort of um, plant identification moved into, uh, are there things that were brought from Europe with the European colonists that allowed it to mix? Like, let's... Let's uh, let's return to the to the stew. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, we see that in a lot of the plants. I teach. Um, I you know I'm a grad student, but I make my living teaching people how to forage uh, wild plants and mushrooms for food. And one thing, you know, almost all of the wild plants that we eat, many of them are weeds, and they're from you know, where you're from, they're from the UK and, um, like dandelion and chickweed and net, a stinging nettle. Those are not native to the United States. And it's, it's interesting, native American and first nations, people didn't eat stinging nettle, but, um, until, you know, white colonists were like, Hey, we actually, this is a good food. You can totally eat this. And they're like, Oh, okay, great. Well, we'll, they were making fiber with it, which it's great for making fiber. And then they kind of adopted its medicinal and, and food uses from the colonists while, the, you know, they taught the colonists how to eat everything in America they had never seen before. And um, there's a great article called Sustained by First Nations that has a lot of information about the kind of transfer of knowledge on food and medicine plants between colonists and, and First Nations people. It's, I really recommend it. Yeah, I, um, I I'm fascinated by that because I'm in Australia now, but the same thing is in play. So where? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good. But um, I was speaking of dandelion. I have a mm. really. I, I live in a, a deconsecrated churchyard, so the the ground is quite Ooh. graveyardy. Oh uh, my lord! <laughs> and uh, there's um, not much light in the backyard, so it's uh, it's there are dandelions everywhere now that we're heading into autumn, and oh, um. And I think about that too. I think you did, like you've been here about as long as my family. Like you're, you're it, it's new, and I love thinking like that. I gave a presentation at the beginning of the year in uh, mm. the College of Micronesia about ethnobotany, and that, wonderful. One of the like sort of the main questions when we talk about this stuff is um, when did nature stop? Uh, so mm. When do you kind of? And it's the sort of eternal question when you're talking about biodiversity about what is an introduced species and what isn't because that kind of thinking comes from the same uh, you know um, human racism of the 19th century that certain people belong certain places oh my lord and yeah. uh, and I find it really <laughs> fascinating that if you do have a from an animist perspective if you grant agency and personhood to these organisms all of a sudden you have a different view about how we interact, and that's why I like ethnobotany. It's 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 a relation of persons, some of whom are human, and some of whom are plant, and uh, mm. and the story of things like dandelion or or even uh, Adam and Eve root is is of that yeah. uh, interaction. And I taught a class um, on Sunday at my favorite local witch witchcraft store in Asheville. It's called Raven and Crone, and I taught a class on the the poisonous plants of the Solanaceae in witchcraft, and. Um, because I, I definitely identify as an ethnobotanist, and I'm I'm desperately trying to go to the University of Kent for my PhD to do their ethnobotany PhD program, because there's really not one in the Western world except for there. <laughs> and uh, we'll see how that works out. But, um, you know, I was talking to them about mandrake and belladonna and all these herbs that are not from here, and some will grow here, but, you know, like mandrake is very hard to grow here. And I was like, you know, you have dandelion all over your yard. And it makes a lovely root that looks very similar to Yeah, metric. it does. <laughs> and it won't kill you if you accidentally, you know, eat it or do anything strange with it. So and from a not herb, that Mandrake will, but No, no. And from a herb manage, magic perspective, I mean it, it won't get you high. Um but it does no. it does appear to have um extended uses because dandelion is um lion's tooth. And yeah, there's Dante some Leon. Yeah. <laughs> and there's some indication that it um got some of that association not just astrologically but potentially all the way back to Egypt so you have different mm. way like stories that are available to us are associated with these plants and uh, it's it's been one of my kind of learnings I guess over the last 10 years is uh, yeah growing up in Australia uh, and reading is this would have been potentially similar if you were um, reading similar books in your teens uh there's all this stuff that is associated with land I don't live on, <laughs> and I was kind of <laughs> kind of jealous, and uh, and it's been about sort of working out the the language of my bioregion and presumably your bioregion and so on. Mm. Yeah, it's very interesting, and I I tried to speak about that in my class, and I was like, you know, it's great. I love talking about these historic European visionary plants. Um, and entheogens and poisons. And I also want to encourage you to go out and discover the American mandrake, the um, may apple is what we call it, um, and go discover sassafras root and sassafras and discover the plants around you 
that are kind of our bioregional equivalents. Like, you know, you know they're not going to give you the same effect if you're trying to make a flying ointment or do something else more dicey. But um, <laughs> if you want to make a fetish out of roots or something, you have a million choices of a plant right outside that grows really easily, like burdock or, you know, curly dock. We have all these big taprooted crazy plants here in Appalachia. So, so how did you... Um... I mean, this is something you studied so that you got to uh, so far master's level on it. I mean, how was, um, tell us about how that happened. Like, it's okay. I need to, I need to get me properly qualified in this stuff. Mm. It's really funny. I mean, (laughs) I have a degree in plant and soil science from the university of Vermont in my undergrad and that I was studying ecological agriculture. It's my concentration in that department. And I wanted to learn how to grow food. And so I'm a, I'm a big gardener. I help people start farms and a lot of my, paid living work has been on organic farms and helping people and teaching workshops and, and on farming. And that made me realize I love to teach. I love teaching people how to do things. I have a lot of patience and love for the act of teaching. And, you know, people started asking me if I would teach classes on witchcraft and on other things. And I just didn't feel qualified to speak, um, about that stuff in the same way that I do about agriculture. Cause I had been trained so much in it. And I found this Appalachian Studies program at App State, which I adore, and it's been amazing. They really have let me do exactly what I want. I took a course in biogeography last semester and on the Appalachian Mountains, and I've taken you know global mountain studies comparative courses, and it's just it's fantastic. And now, you know, I love to write. I love to cite my sources. <laughs> I love to be able to research things more authentically. And historically, and I just wanted to be able to, you know, really, I don't know, it's hard to say, I guess I wanted that credibility that comes with those degrees, but I also love being in school. So it's also just part, partially gotcha. loving that. Yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a sort of retroactive credibility that's required there. If you, you, if you're kind of already doing it, and people are asking for it, you're like, well, that probably means I can probably do this. But you kind of want to almost <laughs> retroactively go, okay, to convince myself I can do it. <laughs> That's I'm gonna very go true. And, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I, I like that idea. I think when you're doing something, when you're doing something new, mm. you kind of have to build your own degree. Like if you're, if you do end up in Kent yes. to complete the PhD, then if you look Not back really. across, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you look back across the sort of layers, you have essentially a science degree is an undergrad and then you're here doing folklore at a master's and then, well, we can call it folklore. You can buy a regional life ways, blah, blah. Um, and then <laughs> like the kind of ethnobotanical one at the top and you go, well, that's, that, that will be a singularly unique configuration if slash when it all comes off. I know, it would be very strange. Uh, I have so many different interests. It's kind of, I mean, when people are like, Becky, okay, so you, you sing, you are an artist, you also are obsessed with plants and you make crafts, you make baskets, you carve spoons. Like what do you, what are you going to do? Like, how are you going to narrow this focus down? And I'm like, do I really have to, do I have to choose one thing? Is it, is it that wide though? Oh. I, can, I see, I see the through line because I I, I've, uh, I, you know, obviously being Australian, uh, massive permaculture nerd um, and I don't see, I see a through line between the stuff you're interested in because it is about well, thank um, you. <laughs> making and, and, and local engaging and, and, and local experiencing and, and just general creation and growth. Like I see a through line there. I don't know if, I don't know how people think making baskets is different to, um, you know, succession planning a, uh, you know, an annual garden. I, I, they're this, kind of the same thing. It's so true. I'm actually, I teach um, the undergraduate ethnobotany uh, labs at App State. And on Friday, I'll be teaching basket making. And I think it's great. I get to teach a biological sciences lab and basket making. That's pretty nice. Um, how do the students feel? Because you could freak them out. You could be like, this is pass fail. It's all mm-hmm. on the basket. <laughs> I, I should do that to them. I don't know if any of them listen to this podcast, but I want to tell them about it. And like, I, if you had listened, you would know. But yeah. um, I'm going to take them kudzu, you know, because we have white split oak baskets are very famous in Appalachia. But now we have kudzu. And you're talking about like invasive plants. I have very unpopular beliefs among the botany department are you, uh, about invasive plants. Okay. Well, you probably oh, can we have that discussion? Because I suspect we we're, we're in complete alignment. I um, think we are. <laughs> so, Becky, okay, and let me just guess on this. Becky, why should we lay off kudzu? 
Um, well, because it's edible, it's a forage plant, it's useful for basket making, paper making, um, it's an anti-erosion plant, it's, you know, it, it does it all. I mean, it was brought here to do it all. And we brought it here very intentionally. Um, I wrote an article about it, it's on my blog, if anyone's interested in reading more about kudzu. Um, it's, and also the roots of it have a starch that's edible as a flower replacement, and it's useful as a treatment for alcoholism. It's just an amazing plant, and I'm obsessed with it. I love kudzu. <laughs> Former presidents recommended people planting it. Like, uh, and it it is frustrating to me that it's now become a phrase of of something that's kind of this is now it's like kudzu, you know, as something that's gotten away from it. But uh, for me, and why I don't, <clears throat> why I, why I kind of like to pull people up when they use words like invasive species is um, yeah. Well, let's let's look at this. So in Australia, we have the one that gets blamed a lot is called lantana. Lantana mm. is um, it's vigorously growing and it has spines and it's all the things Ooh. that are associated with that you would call like a bad guy plant. However, <laughs> like it grows on disturbed soil, so mm. it is in permaculture. I'm sure you're aware. Um, we don't really use the word weeds. We use recovery species um, oh, yeah. fr from like a soil restoration perspective. Now, when Lantana takes over big chunks of farm, the question you want to ask yourself is, well, why? And it's like, oh, well, because like we bulldozed a bit of it and, um, you know, it was compacted <laughs> and then it was compacted and then it subsided. And you go, so wait a minute. It's not Lantana then, isn't it? It's you. You fucked the soil. And, <laughs> and, and this is the plant restoring what you ruined. Uh, because you'll notice it doesn't grow wild in the bush, where the actual kind of ecosystem has all its niches filled and the soil biology is what you would expect for the region. And this is where people, like, and I get, this is my kind of rant about using the word invasive and, and kind of getting people to understand its politics. Because uh, my, my country has, like, the worst examples of invasive species, but also the worst examples of blaming species for things we did. Oh, that's so true. I mean, that's like poison ivy in the South. It is a native plant, but people, you know, complain about poison ivy. And it, it grows in disturbed areas that need time to heal. And so I always tell people to think of it like, I'm not quite, you know, at the level of like sister ivy. You know, a lot of people call it sister ivy, like as if you speak to her that way, she won't get you a terrible rash but I still get it anyway. Um, and so it's like a keep out sign to stay off the disturbed soil until it heals, you know, and it eventually will move on once the forest moves on in secession. And I love to think of kudzu like that. It's like, if you just exploded this hillside and then kudzu took over, honestly, you should be thankful for it because yes, it does kill trees, but you know, it's also covering this bare wasteland of soil you've left on the side of the highway. <laughs> Yeah, and it allows it to accumulate life and minerals and so on. It's uh, absolutely my. Um, we're doing it again at the moment. I was reading articles in the Guardian about it today. But Australia has yeah. one of the longest. Um, the Murray Darling Basin is one of the longest sort of riverine agricultural areas in the world. And when I was growing up, um, they, you would get all these blue green algae blooms in it, and it, the discussions would be, oh. "Well, how do we, um, how do we get rid of the blue green algae?" And I'm like, "Well, wait a fucking minute." That's there because of the nitrate runoff from all the farms because your farming practices are wrong and the blue-green algae <laughs> is eating the nitrate and returning the river to health. But it like the blue-green algae is wrong and we're right. And you go, that's any of these times you see these invasive blooms, inevitably it will be the opposite. It will be uh, – and, and dandelions in people's yards, as you know, is the same. That's um, – Oh my gosh, uh, restoring yeah. compacted soil that you have ruined like it, it is the mm -hmm. earth and the plants healing itself it's true and i mean dandelion is one of my favorites because one it's delicious and every part every single part of it is edible i mean except maybe the stem but even the stem if you want to eat it you can it won't hurt you <laughs> and i just don't understand why people hate dandelion so much <laughs> we didn't used to it's the same with comfrey i mean my i oh, remember yeah. my um my grandfather was a very keen gardener and kind of mm -hmm. uh, in that mid to well, early to mid 20th century fought in the war, but um, where he could do anything, he could graft roses or, or what have you. And he had that kind uh, of like Edwardian um, naturalist lovely. sort of idea. And he was uh, like, he would leave. I remember having the discussion with him about things like dandelion and comfrey in the yard. And he's like, no, 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 that does that, that does that. 
um, we keep those things. And, and it's only recently that we've kind of... Uh, th- there's a reason Dandelion and Comfrey is in your country and in mine. It's mm-hmm. because it's very useful. <laughs> it's true, and it's very good at what it does, which is surviving. And, and it's like what you said before. When people talk about plants as invasive, I'm always like, especially in America, I'm like, what do you think you are, Mr. White Person, standing in American soil? You're an invasive species, and you destroyed the species that was here before you. Like, what? It just makes me very upset when people talk like that. And, and, and I think people need to understand that it's, it is literally from the same era and same kind of high imperial worldview about how the planet worked that certain people belong in certain places or at certain levels and and the same thing with plants like this is this was the settled science of the 19th century and it's it's funny that we're kind of generally uh, obviously we're not there yet but um from a human (laughs) from a human perspective we are kind of rapidly moving out of that way of thinking um yeah on balance but we, we still have this kind of 19th century um racial idiocy uh mm-hmm. when it comes to plants and I, I mean part of my presentation in in uh, micronesia in january was talking about how we think about biodiversity in a um, post-invasive model world because mm. we talk about uh, given that uh, like we spend millions and not that much we obviously need to spend more but we spend millions around the world <laughs> doing things that i think are ridiculous like uh, yeah. paying national parks people to go and um, remove plants that have just been deemed invasive. And you go, well, let's just stop and think about how that works. And funnily enough, having crediting nature with animism and agency means you need to look at that again. Uh, And the best examples of that are obviously island ecosystems. But if you look at the US, it has about, at a guess, um, sort of 40% of the biodiversity in the US is introduced. Um, yeah. is in is introduced by humans in the last several hundred years to be specific. You mm-hmm. have an overall biodiversity increase. Um, surely that's good. Do you know what I mean? Like th- there's been about 80, yeah. spe- 80 to 150 species loss and about 4,500 in. No, yeah. 2,800 in. So you've got to look at it and go, well, I think the entire model that, you know, kudzu and, and, and so on is taking over the whole country and and killing things is provably incorrect we've had a biodiversity increase and it's time to think given the sort of environmental challenges we face differently about which plant allies can help in um yes in returning our relationship to something much more healthy i totally agree with you and i'd love to hear your talk if you recorded it on that you gave us i'll send you a link for sure i would love to hear it (laughs) and yeah have you read that book invasive plant medicine I haven't, but it's on my list. Okay, I really think you'll like it. Um, it's definitely gonna be preaching to the choir, but you know, it's <laughs> it's really wonderful. And I I'm a big fan of Japanese knotweed, and I always thought it was bamboo growing up on our farm. It was all over the place in Pennsylvania when we lived there for a while. And uh, I found out that my friend had worked a summer in the national park, dropping individual drops of Roundup into the exposed, uh, cut open <laughs> pieces. Well, I eat those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're edible, and they may have uh, the roots may have compounds that fight Lyme's disease. So it's it's you know, let's just throw a roundup on it. <laughs> uh, so well, funnily enough, this is a good next question, um, be- and it's a leading question, I think, from the conversation we've just had. Of but uh, it, it is what it is. <laughs> so uh, Appalachian herbalism, uh, how to describe this? Is it complete? Do you know what I mean? Is it complete? As in, exactly. is it a fixed body of knowledge? This is the thing. If you, I don't know if you oh. know Tim Ingle, um, <clears throat> but when we talk about traditional plant medicine, he hates that term and prefers ethnobotany because it implies that it's finished and put to bed. I hear what you're saying. Okay, I understand now. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I mean, it's constantly growing. You know, a hundred years ago, Appalachian folk medicine. You know, we have very, a unique way in Appalachian folk medicine that we look at, you know, the, at the blood. It's almost like the four humors in medieval medicine. Um, you know, you can have high or low, thick or thin, sour or sweet. And what you, you do a lot of things with herbs to augment the blood, to move it. And that is kind of the underlying, some of the underlying theories of health in Appalachia. 
And those come from those beliefs and that, you know, they come from all the different places we were talking about before that influences the folk magic, which, you know, folk medicine, folk magic, they're kind of the same thing. So, but, um, it's definitely not, you know, it, it, it changes now constantly. I mean, even in the past seven years I've been here, I feel like it's changing. Well, yeah, that's, that's kind of my point to the presentation. Um, was uh, Ponape's colonial history is um, mm. Spanish and Japanese and so on. And um, I, the question I asked the kids was, some of these Japanese plants have been here 150 years. At what point do we call them native? Because they, um, they're they useful. They're, it's it's sort of maple and things that are used in building and, and, and what have you. They just weren't there on this island beforehand and have mm. been incorporated into its biodiversity. And I think... That was kind of when it comes to herbalism. If you get the context right, so if you can kind of line up with your history and bioregion correctly, and in your case it's Appalachia, then the question mm-hmm. becomes: with these skills, what other sort of? Um, it doesn't mean there won't be more plant allies. It doesn't mean there won't be more configurations. And I, I kind of wonder if we're on uh, the edge of 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 a. Uh, of a renaissance of kind of folk herbalism mm-hmm. in that way because yeah. of that, uh, the availability of historical context and, and connectivity. I mean, thoughts? I know. I totally agree with that. I really, uh, I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm just starting to write my thesis right now. And it's kind of like, why ethnobotany? Why folkways? Why bioregional studies? You know, and I feel like these questions all kind of meld into each other. but. I don't know if I can really even expound on what you just said because I agree with the, <laughs> the direction you're going in. I know it's really it's really terrible that we don't disagree about more things, but uh, um, well, then I'm going to ask you questions that yes. I don't obviously don't know the answer to, so uh, we don't get in the situation. <laughs> All right, because oh, like if we are talking about <laughs> no, it's my bad, but it's really fun to talk to someone else who because it's it's almost like a secret conspiracy of kudzu or or lantana I because i can't it's one of the things you kind of can't really talk about in in polite company and you go but you're all wrong and i'm not <laughs> isn't it wonderful to feel that way oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's so true i know but luckily there are a lot of people yes and i'm in a very weird community here in appalachia we have a very large primitive skills community or bushcraft i think is what they call it overseas um people who like to live in old timey, pretty extreme old timey ways. Um, and so many of us have um, alternative opinions. Nice. About things. <laughs> nice. Well, I, I mean, let's just kind of run through um, some of the Appalachia associated herbs, like what they are, um, you know, what they do and that kind of thing. And then, and this is sort of a, a follow on, um, we'll have a chat about how people might get started with herb law, and I'm going to make it difficult for you, but I'm going to hold off on why until we have the um, oh, some some sorry. of the plant ally conversations first. <laughs> okay, lovely. Well, did you want me to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just um, jump into herbs. P- pick some and, and kind okay. of. Um, Appalach splain some uh, some plant hellos. <laughs> I adore you, and also that was really amazing. Um, I think one of the first I think of is poke. Uh, are you familiar with poke? Pretend uh, no. Let's. I'm just going to say no. Okay, cool. Well, poke is um, a wonderful plant. It's often called poke salad, not salad salad, and it's. Um, Phytolaca is its Latin name, and it has a it's a toxic plant in a lot of ways, but it is also edible and delicious and a traditional food of the springtime here. And its root is a tinctured and is a low dose medicinal, meaning it you know you can poison yourself if you have too much of it. Um, used for cystic and tumorous conditions, especially breast cancer and other uh, tumor type, and um, even just regular cysts under the skin. But it's, you know, a one to two drop dose kind of thing. And uh, the berries were used to make ink and are also uh, traditionally one or two are eaten in the spring as kind of an immune boost. And you boil the young greens through two changes of water. I, well, some people say three. I do two changes of water and cook them in uh, some good fat back, bacon fat. And they're delicious. And then kind of lemony. And I, it's one of my favorite plants. It has so many uses and it's beautiful, pinkish, 
thick, fleshy stems and lovely dark purple berries. It's one of my favorites. That sounds amazing. I, I, I thought I'd heard of it. That I have not at all. I wonder if I can get that here. I wonder if... I'll um, send you some seeds if you like. Well, yeah, <laughs> let me just make sure that um, that isn't illegal because uh, state by state, Australia is alarmingly protective. And this is kind of my point about different colored people and different kinds of plants getting into the country. <laughs> <laughs> we have a thing about gooseberries here in North Carolina. We're not, no one's allowed to have any gooseberries. So oh, I understand. They're delicious. Yeah. I know. We actually have some. Don't tell anyone. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Illicit gooseberry. Um, but yeah, I just wrote a, a piece for um, Rubedo Press's Spiritus Gnosis journal about three of my favorite Appalachian you know, roots. And so I'll just tell you the other two. And mm-hmm. then I think that's like a good trifecta to kind of jump in, you know? Yep. Um, the second one will be sassafras, you know, mm-hmm. sassy frass. Um, and I love sassafras because it's heterophilic. It has heterophily, meaning multiple leaf shapes on one plant. Um, it has, you know, the mitten shaped one, a dinosaur foot or the dino foot, as I like to call it, or the crow's foot. And then a, just a single lobe leaf and they're all on the same plant and it smells like root beer. So it's, it's really fantastic. And uh, you can use the leaves um, dried. They were used in gumbo uh, to thicken it. A filet powder is made from sassafras leaves. And the root bark was boiled every spring in Appalachia as a blood cleanser. And it, it tastes fantastic. And I love love sassafras tea. And I actually just made some sassafras candies from boiled root tea with honey. It was very really good. Um, you could sell that. Yeah. That's, uh, that sounds delicious, sassafras candies. Well, guess what? You can't sell it because it's illegal to sell sassafras now because of sassafras, the chemical in sassafras, that when purely injected into a rat will give them liver problems. But obviously you'd have to like, uh, you'd have to eat like a million sassafras candies to get. This is, this is the same. <laughs> kind of yeah. thing. It, it appears yeah. comfrey is, is, uh, has some miraculous qualities, but it turns out that if you were to eat essentially 280 pounds and you were third trimester pregnant you would slightly increase the risk of um losing the pregnancy and you go well that's kind of dumb isn't it (laughs) that's kind of a a dumb thing to say about people saying be careful with this possibly miraculous plant and its many healing qualities because in this very specific instance something bad will happen yeah and that's what most things are like you know um there's so many things like that with plants. And I was reading about, um, you know, Colt's foot has some, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Colt's foot. It's used, it's used as a traditional ingredient in a lot of cold remedies. It was, the leaves were smoked uh, for asthma and other, you know, lung and, and phlegm problems, basically. And it's used with wild cherry bark, which is another common Appalachian cough remedy and, and lung kind of healer. And it's now they're saying, you know, don't use it because it's got... Um, I can't remember the, the chemical name. It's POA as its uh, abbreviation, but it's you know some liver toxic chemical. But it's been used for thousands of years as a medicine. <laughs> yeah, um, and the final herb in the trifecta is um, the may apple or the American mandrake. And uh, this one is more dicey. It's definitely also kind of toxic, um, but it produces a lovely yellow fruit that hangs down that is relished by box turtles and. Um, small children. It's a delicious little fruit, uh, but if you eat it when it's green, it's quite toxic. So you have to make sure they're very ripe. <laughs> they're called may pops often. They're like a little umbrella plant. They used to be called witches umbrellas too, because they became associated with witchcraft after um, settlers falsely identified them as mandrakes because their roots are quite big. And there's actually a anti-cancer drug that's made today that is synthesized from those roots. And you can, many people around here will dig them and sell them in the spring. Cool. Um, but yeah, and I've used the roots for making um, owl runes or, or root fetishes. Um, and I love the plant. It's beautiful and it grows along river sides covering the areas. So you can kind of imagine the little turtles under these big umbrellas. It's very sweet. <laughs> nice. Nice. All right. Mm-hmm. So um, this is where I said I'm going to make it slightly difficult, but sort of not. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> how would you recommend, Becky, that... Uh, people get started with herb law. So I'm going to ask you about a couple of book recommendations, but also a couple of plant recommendations. And I'm going to make mm-hmm. it difficult by saying, let's sort of tailor your advice to a challenging situation, like someone living in an apartment in Hong Kong. Like how does one start 
with that because I think if we start at the most challenging, the majority of people realistically who are listening to this uh, podcast don't live in apartments in Hong Kong. But if we start there, uh, <laughs> everyone else may presumably have like you know potentially even slightly more freedom uh, when it comes to exploring plant lore and actual plant allies. That's a great question. I think if you're just looking at plant lore in general, um, a really great way to get involved in that is before you even pick up a book is go and walk with someone that knows. And a lot of universities offer plant walks, um, botanical gardens. Almost every city has a botanical garden, at least a tiny one. Even our little town has one um, that have ethnobotanical plant walks. And I mean, I've seen them all over. I just went down to Birmingham, Alabama and went on one. Um, and yeah, go ask a person. Don't look at a book because until you actually look at and touch and experience a few plants, the books won't mean much to you. You know, it, it's difficult to absorb just information from a book when you've never met the plant. And you'd be surprised if you live in an urban area, how many useful plants are growing in the cracks around you, you know? Well, yeah, because half of them are weeds, which, as we discussed, is, uh, <laughs> is not it's an really... offensive term. Exactly. How dare you? I know. A weed is just a plant out of place, is I guess what my, my weeds ecology teacher told us in exactly. college. <laughs> um, all right. So that's actually amazing advice. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, it's it's a really good way of putting it because it's, 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 in, it's near universal advice. It's kind of uh, the same for any kind of interaction yeah. with a living system so that's good let's try and think of some sort of universally either useful friendly or dare i say easy plant allies for your little hong kong mm. apartment well i think everyone could benefit from a few plants and one of them is is definitely nettle um it's a cheap and abundant plant to purchase as well from you know a health food store um, if you can't, you know, find it growing around you, but it does grow in a lot of different places. And that all is, you know, good for allergies. It's always, um, mineral rich and helpful for people with, you know, anemic or like blood that they have conditions where their blood needs to be built, you know, men and women, but a very good medicine for women too, who bleed. And, um, uh, yeah, I think nettle is a great example and it's also a food. So, you know, you can mix it into soups and stews too. And, uh, Every part of it is useful. You can even make fiber. I, I teach a fish net weaving and I make fiber out of nettles and weave them into nets. You know, you can do anything with it. It's amazing. <laughs> cool. All right. And um, actually, that's a, yeah, that one's a good choice. Uh, book wise, and, and I'm going to split the book question. Um, mm -hmm. Just pretty good books on plants or herbalism, one or two, and um, some books either about Appalachian folk magic or mm. Appalachia in general, like so that you can kind of do the combine the books in your head story to mm. get context. Okay. Um, for herbs in general, I really like, so I guess if you're in America, um, Judith Sumner wrote American Household Botany, 1600 to 1900. It's like one of my favorite books. And she also wrote A Natural History of Herbs which is very good. Um, if you're, you know, anywhere um, that's not specific to the States, it's, I really love uh, medicines from the heart of the earth. Um, I love uh, the medical herbalism book is fantastic. If you're interested, I love phytochemistry. So I really like that angle. Plus it has traditional uses and dosages and recipes. Um, and it's like a book that anyone can use from anywhere. It has a lot of different stuff in it. Um, and Appala as far as Appalachia goes, uh, Appalachian Folkways is a great book. And all the Foxfire books, there's a ton of them, but um, they're kind of like the crash course in folklore. There are no definitive books on folk Appalachian folk magic, except for one by Eden McCoy called Mountain Magic that's no longer in print. But I'm working on one right now, so hopefully there will be Yay. one soon. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And in addition to that, because that sounds like a, an exciting place to – and Becky, for people mm -hmm. who obviously want to know more, and I'm pretty sure everyone does. <laughs> I'm uh, very flattered by that. <laughs> yeah. where, uh, where would they go to find out more about yourself and what you got going on? Well, my website is bloodandspicebush.com. And um, you can email me through there. I have all my classes and workshops, which I've been 
people have been asking me like, are you going to record them and put them on a video? I'm like, well, I'll have to figure out how to do that, but I'll try to do some so I can do more distance classes. But I teach in the Southern United States. And um, if you're around, I'd love to, to have you if you're in Georgia or Virginia or Tennessee or North Carolina. But yeah, that's where you can find me. I'm on Instagram as Blood and Spice Bush and have class announcements and things like that on there as well. Fantastic. And I will make sure this is all up in the show notes. Oh, thank you. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Oh, you as well. I was really looking forward to this. And it's oh, it's fun to, to find another sort of secret good zoo <laughs> conspirator. So, uh... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so, Becky, thank you so very much for your time. Oh, thank you. As the song goes, these are a few of my favourite things. Ethnobotany, The Awesomeness of Weeds, Bioregion-Specific Magic, Plant Allies, and Illicit Gooseberries. Very good times. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts, uh, or feel free to share your own bioregional experiences. The best place for this would be runesoup.com or the RuneSoup Facebook page. Otherwise, stay in touch by subscribing to the show on YouTube or in your favourite podcatcher. And or find me on Twitter, where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time. <laughs>